Partners, ladies and gentlemen, please be upstanding for the chair and vice chair of Harlow Council. Tragedies that have occurred since our last full council. It will be too horrific to list them all. We'll just remember all the people who died. Thank you. Thank you. Please sit down. <coughs> Apologies for absence. Yes. Thank you, Chair. Councillors Beckett, Truman and Waite. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. I've got Councillor Andrew Johnson, Shona Johnson, Simon Carter, Eddie Johnson, Russell Perry and Nick Johnson. Thank you. I can see both of you quickly for our Declarations of interest. Anybody got any declarations of interest? No? Right. Minutes of the last meeting. Has everyone read them? Do you agree that are and correct uh, record? And I should sign them. Agreed. Now, statistics are a wonderful tool, 
which can be used to support any argument so long as you present them in the correct way. And the statistics released by Essex Police don't tell us if more crimes are being committed or if now they are actually being reported. Either way, I still believe this motion is relevant. Now, part of me would love to take this opportunity to replay some of the referendum campaign and talk about the rights and wrongs, but it's my belief that this wouldn't bring about any reassurance to the people in our community who currently feel vulnerable. But as we go through this turbulent political time, every member of this chamber should be more vigilant of these crimes. If you witness a hate, hate crime, report it. If you hear a hate crime, report it. And if you are a victim of one yourself, report it. So to the people who feel vulnerable in our community at this present time, the message is very clear. This council stands beside you, and whilst I am a part of it, it always will. So I ask you to, um, to vote in favour of this motion. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Madam Chairman. I would like to welcome this motion on a diverse and tolerant society. It is important in this chamber that we send a strong message that hate crime will not be tolerated in any shape or form in this town. And I think we all agree with that. If you look at the national figures on hate crime, the picture is concerning. More than 6,000 hate crimes have been reported to the police in England, Wales and Northern Ireland in the wake of the EU referendum. This means that the overall level is up 20% on the same period in July 2015. Essex Police recently revealed that there has been a 50% increase in hate crime complaints in the wake of the EU referendum vote. Police chiefs across the country agree that these figures are still far too high. Now I work for a major charity that helps people of all abilities and backgrounds across the United Kingdom into work. One of the key areas of concern for me personally is disability hate crime. In the United Kingdom, recorded hate crime against disabled people increased 41% in 2015. The Crime Survey for England and Wales has recorded an average of 70,000 incidents of disability hate crime per year between 2012 to 2015. Far too often, people with disabilities lack the confidence to report hate crime. We need to change this. It is time to change perceptions and show strong leadership to help tackle this terrible crime in our society. There needs to be more, a more concerted effort to work with social media companies to tackle disability hate crime online. Cyberbullying is an increasing problem online and prosecutions against trolls are on the increase. It is important that social media companies update their cyberbullying restrictions to include a specific ban on disability harassment. We also need to tackle the impact of terminology and language in bringing about culture change. Language that respects disabled people as active individuals with control over their own lives is an important thing to do in all walks of life. Helping people to use inclusive language will hate, help change perceptions on disability and reduce hate crime. Disability hate crime has no place in modern society and we should all stand together in solidarity against this, any form of hostility to others, irrespective of their ability or their background. Progress is being made to tackle hate crime but the key policing bodies and the government. Our new Home Secretary has commissioned Her Majesty Inspector of Constabulary to carry out a scoping study into forces understanding and the response to hate crime in all, of all types, including crimes against disabled people. Now I welcome also the government's action plan on hate crime. They want to <coughs> assess the levels of anti-Muslim, anti-Semitic, homophobic, <coughs> racist and other bullying in schools. This will be used to inform a further action against such bullying. Action to tackle hate crime online, in public transport, and around the nighttime economy are priorities too. There's a £2.4 million, million pound fund for security measures at places of worship, but of particular interest to this council is a £300,000 fund to establish 
projects to explore innovative new ways of tackling hate crime in local communities. Taking all these matters into consideration, I maintain the view that Harlow is an open and tolerant community. There may be isolated cases of hate crime in our town, but the overwhelming majority of residents in our community respect each other. It is important that this council continues to drive home the importance of an open and welcoming community to all. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, groups, which uh, I think is important as well. I was appalled at the change of focus recently um, with the attack on immigrants in general. And that was immediately to make it non-political, <laughs> was condemned by John Major as, as well, having an impact. And it was no surprise to me that there has been an increase, and a quite dramatic increase, in hate crime in our community. Because in a sense, it was giving the green light to it. Yet it is completely unacceptable that, for example, a black woman, um, who's lived in the town for decades, literally, suddenly started to receive abuse. It is completely unacceptable that in, in at least one primary school, small children were really, really anxious that they were about to be sent away from their school and friends. It is completely unacceptable that Muslims and their place of worship have been singled out for abuse and also attack. And there has been a disturbing tendency to treat the other, the outsider, on spurious, spurious migrant status. And bearing in mind that we've had some 700,000 years of immigration in this country, it really is about time we got used to the idea. However, <laughs> <clears throat> they, the others, are blamed for the shortage of housing, jobs, lower wages, a drain on resources like the National Health Service, compared with actually addressing the specific issues um, in what we would argue fight against austerity measures, but certainly a fight that we're all in it together fight and not dividing off into others rather and us. We should adopt a positive approach and maybe we could start with the NHS and say that we're proud and pleased that our services at the hospital rely on staff from many countries in the world and without them we couldn't function. Um, they have concerns too that they're not allowed to stay in the United Kingdom. So we should be calling for assurances that no staff at the hospital will be deported and give them the assurance that that applies equally <coughs> to all groups who fulfill vital community roles contributing to the life of the town. So I welcome this resolution very much. Um, what it says is we're all standing together with you in fighting against me. <laughs> right, I'd just like to say I, I support this resolution. Um, Great Britain is probably one of the most tolerant countries on earth. Mm. Picking on individuals from other countries is clearly wrong. But unfortunately, fear is one of the main causes of this problem. Fear of not getting a job, fear of not getting a home, fear of not being able to get the school place you want, and fear of not being able to see a doctor when you want. Over the past 30 years, the Labour Party and the Conservative Party have run the governments, and they have both, they've both failed in taking these things into account. Neither have built enough houses, neither have made enough school places available, neither have done anything uh, positive about the NHS, if we want to eradicate hate crime, then we have to eradicate fear factor. And if we eradicate the fear factor, hate crime will go away. Thank you. Councillor Pryor. Thank you. First thing is, 
we from the UK group totally support everything that has been said in this chamber so far. And we will be supporting the motion. I agree and also condemn all of the terrorist actions which have taken place across Europe and in other nations. I also condemn on behalf of Harlow UKIP any acts that cause hate crimes or attacks. These actions are not acceptable and we should live in a country, a county and a town of tolerance. As has been said, Harlow is a diverse, tolerant and welcoming town. I believe that it was created um, originally housing many East End Londoners who are the after effects of World War II. We've always been welcoming, we've always been a growing community. It really saddens me that Essex Police are saying hate crimes have risen since the referendum. A jump of 50% is saddening, shocking, shocking and appalling. I've had many residents and many people, I'm, I'm getting a bit sad seeing incidents reported and witnessed of hate crime in the town. I had a Muslim woman in town tell me that her and her three children were shouted on their way to going to school, shouted to go home. Um, two nights ago, just at five minutes in the Civic Centre in Dad's Wood, a couple of uh, children of Pakistani descent were again shouted at to go home. Luckily, the innocence of those children in what the statement was said replied, but mum said I can stay up to eight. <laughs> <laughs> but this is serious and this isn't okay. We've got, it's, it's a top priority to this council to make sure that all hate crime is abolished, that, that people are educated and people understand the actions and the, the influence of their actions and their words. We've got a responsibility as politicians and as community leaders to show leadership to our community to never give in and play the politics of fear, to condemn hate crime <coughs> and to work together for a better society. I've called any of us that witness any hate crime to report it, no matter how small, for so long I think it has been written off for odd comments and it's not okay for members of the public to witness it because it's not only worse than these people that are saying it but for people to stand by, that is how we allow this to develop in our society. So we all have a role to make sure that these individuals feel welcome in our society we're diverse and we're a tolerant town and we will remain that way and we'll fight off the odd few individuals who try to uh, divide us um, and commit these acts of hate crime. Does anybody else wish to speak? In that case, Councillor Muller, do you wish to sum up? I have nothing to add apart from thanking all the councillors for their contributions. Thank you. Yes, I now move to the vote. Is everybody in favour? Anybody against? Carried then unanimously. Uh, motion, Councillor Clement, and would you like to propose? I propose the motion. Um, you know. okay, I mentioned some very brief introductory remarks. So, second it first, sorry. Uh, second it, Chair. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> second it, <laughs> <year>, sorry. <laughs> right. Sorry. Um, as it says in the first line of this motion, I'm, I'm absolutely a passionate believer in devolving powers, responsibilities, um, and resources to um, as low a level as is possible. Um, that local councils are in the best position to understand their communities, their needs and aspirations, and to take the right decisions about investments in infrastructure, in housing, and, and in skills. One of the reasons I, I brought this motion um, before Council, it has been discussed um, briefly uh, before, is I've been involved in um, some discussions with leaders of councils across Essex, including Essex County Council, the 12 districts, boroughs and city, uh, and, and the two unitaries. And while there is some potential for um, getting an appropriate level of, of funding that might make a material difference to the investment in infrastructure, in housing, and in skills, that will make a difference to uh, Harlow and our local communities. Uh, those discussions have got some way to go. And I think what's really important is we recognise that one size does not fit all. What works for London or Manchester or Liverpool won't necessarily work for Essex. Um, Essex is a very diverse and geographically large um, place. Uh, it's not as compact as places like Manchester and London. I know London's very large, but, but um, it is fundamentally different. 
and there has been a presumption, um, admittedly with a different Chancellor um, and a different Minister for Communities and Local Government, that um, there was a prescriptive model that must apply for all devolution deals, and that included a directly elected Executive Mayor. Um, as I say, that clearly works in London. It, it probably will work in Manchester. Um, my assertion is it won't work in Essex. Um, it's too big um, geographically. It is too diverse. Uh, and we have to remember that not that long ago, um, admittedly in a slightly different context, Harlow actually had a, a vote on whether it wanted a directly elected and rejected it. So this for me really is about just putting a marker down from this council that says we are in favour of the principle of devolving powers, responsibilities and resources um, and that we ought to continue in the dialogue. Um, but that does not mean we will accept being in a, you know, a cookie cutter model being, being imposed that will be inappropriate um, for, for Essex and for Harlow. Um, and one final thing and I'll, I'll, I'll um, sit down is um, the presumption has been, and it's not in the motion, I, I know, that um, the right lump for a devolution deal in this part of the world um, is the county of Essex, including the two unitaries. And that might well be the right answer, but there are other <coughs> options. If you look at what the functional economic areas in this space, it includes um, East Hearts as well as um, Ottlesford and, and, and Epping Forest. Um, it includes the corridor from London to Cambridge, <coughs> um, where uh, the life sciences. And I think we need to have a, a, an open mind about what the possible deals are. And I hope, with a, a new government, um, that um, they'll be <coughs> recognising the specific local needs um, to meet local needs and aspirations. Thank you. John. Uh, Madam Chairman, it is good news that there is clear cross-party consensus on devolution in Essex across this chamber. When the cities and local government devolution bill went through Parliament, I think all local authorities were, in principle, excited about the opportunity to try and take advantage of the powers on offer. The Act recommends the merging of various national funding streams to provide much greater local responsibility for economic development. This is an exciting prospect and something Essex and Harlow should take advantage of. The principle of the changes proposed includes giving new powers in specific policy areas to local authorities, the transfer of additional budgets alongside those powers, and some enhanced power over local taxes. Now, we all agree that handing more policy and financial powers from central government <coughs> to local authorities is a good idea. The aim of the Act is to allow local areas to gain greater responsibility over services such as transport, housing, skills and healthcare. The Act does not explicitly set in stone what can and cannot be devolved, instead it does provide some flexibility and opportunity for local areas to propose what policy areas they seek to be devolved. However, one of the issues clearly, and Councillor Clement has said this, for this council is the precondition that flexibility and greater powers can be delivered through the Act only if a directly elected Mayor is in post to oversee it. That said, some elements of the devolution deals agreed to date will be powers Essex and Harlow want to exploit. They include restructuring the further education system, some business support provision, fiscal powers, including investment funds, uh, integrated transport system autonomy, I think that's particularly exciting for Essex too. Now Essex County Council has registered a clear expression of interest to seek a devolution deal with the government, and it's only right that Essex County Council are determined to secure more powers from Whitehall for this county. But they must now pause and determine a strategy that better reflects what we really want from an enhanced devolution deal in this county. This motion this evening is clear. A directly elected mayor is unworkable in Essex, in our view. It does work, of course, in metropolitan areas, but the established local government structures in this county work well, and they are ready to take on additional powers. While we all are supportive of the principle of devolution, 
It is important that any deal is good for taxpayers. No new power should come with any increase in the cost of local government in our county. A streamlined bureaucracy to implement more responsibilities would be good value for taxpayers' money. Residents want efficiency in public service provision. I think Carlo has a great opportunity to influence this debate. Essex County Council should take time to understand what, county, what the county as a whole really wants from enhanced devolution powers. The recent changes in ministerial positions at DCLG present a chance to open negotiations with the government and for Essex County Council to come up with a devolution proposal to present to government that is welcomed by all local authorities in this county. Thank you, Chair. To the debate, who wishes to speak? Councillor Durkin. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, whilst I completely support the devolution and, and a great advocate for devolution, everything comes with a price and everything comes with a consequence. So I do agree that we shouldn't be rushing at this just because we think it's a golden egg. What we should be doing is actually looking at what is the real benefits to our community and our wider community. And certainly as the Cabinet Member for uh, Enterprise, this is good for business, this is good for enterprise, but it's also good for innovation. But like the leader of the council, I don't want us to be putting all our eggs in one basket and saying the only solution is to the county council. Because actually, if you look at our business model and if you look at our future and where Harlow wants to place itself, we also have to look at other partners in Cambridgeshire, in Hertfordshire, in East Hearts and even Stevenage. And I do urge those three political leaders and our chief executive is that we must keep the door open and we must get the right deal that actually benefits Harlow rather than that it's convenient for Essex County Council to get this through. But it has to be a deal that is based on benefit for our people, not just an easy uh, fix over something like this. So I do welcome this uh, debate, I do welcome the motion, and I do welcome the reassurances that our leader has given. Does anyone else wish to speak? Yes, Councillor. Once again, Madam Chair, I'm not going to say a lot of this, just that I believe what uh, the Leader of the Council, the Leader of the Opposition and Councillor Durden has just said is totally true. We've got to take an opportunity. We've got to look at it and make sure we benefit the residents of Harlow. That's what we're here for. Not here to make things easy for ourselves or to just take opportunities and then they go wrong. We've got to look at it. We've got to make sure we get the right benefit from it. And I'm pleased that I'm involved, will be involved in this negotiation. And I trust that we, we between the, what we talk about in this council, we'll be able to get a fair result for Harlow. Thank you. Does anybody else wish to speak? No? In that case, Councillor Trevor, would you like to sum up? Um, well, I'll say actually, I, I, I love the contribution clearly um, and <coughs> from those who have spoken, and, and also that there is um, a clear cross party consensus uh, on, on this issue. Uh, it has an enormous amount of potential, as Councillor Charles has said. This is a potential opportunity for attracting the right level of funds and powers and responsibilities to make a fundamental difference um, to our town and, and to the, the wider area. But it, we must get that balance right between democratic accountability, between uh, making a material difference to the people and the businesses uh, and the residents of uh, Harlow and, and Essex. And on that basis, I will enthusiastically continue to participate with um, colleagues in this, in this chamber um, in, in that debate. Um, but we mustn't lose sight of the fact, um, as Councillor Charles has said, that it isn't some exercise in juggling the local government deck chairs. This is about trying to make a real difference to the people of the party. We're moving to the vote. All those in favour? Anybody opposed? Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Chairman. Um, well, it's been an eventful year um, for the Council, for Harlow and for the country. Um, I'm going to start by going through some of the highlights that affected Harlow over the last year, a number of which I'll come back to um, when I look at the challenges ahead. But before that, just despite ongoing cost of local government funding, 
the Council continues to exercise tight financial control, is improving performance, and continues to show leadership and tenacity, standing up for Harlow, its residents, businesses, and visitors. In October, we finally secured a deal when others were throwing in the towel to keep the streetlights on overnight, yeah. finance in a sustainable and transparent way, the only place in Essex where that's been achieved. In December, the Council secured a final injunction banning unauthorised encampments across Harlow, the first time this has been achieved at the scale and scope in the country. While some were hurling abuse, we showed the leadership and tenacity to take decisive action. Of course, this isn't the whole story, and we must continue to fight for suitable provision for travellers, balancing firmness with fairness. Following an independent assessment, we've put in train bringing landscape and housing maintenance under council control when the current Care Harlow contract expires next year. This will save Harlow taxpayers money and provide it the flexibility and control necessary. The refurbishment of the town park and Pets Corner completed um, in the last year, culminating, as the chair has said, with its first Green Flag Award to add to the eighth consecutive one for Pond and Wood. Harlow Park Run celebrated its first anniversary and the junior park run started last Sunday with over 110 runners and many, many more family, friends and volunteers. There was a major exhibition on post-war public art in Somerset House in London, with a whole room dedicated to Harlow, which had generated significant interest in Harlow's public art collection. The Art Trust continues to put on great exhibitions in the Gibbet Gallery, there's one there now, by nationally and internationally renowned artists, cementing Harlow's reputation of both a great art legacy and a bright artistic future. We also officially opened two new council house developments, the first in a generation in Harlow, and I was particularly pleased we were able to name them Riley Muse, in honour of the Riley brothers from Harlow who died in the First World War, and Foster Court, in honour of Robert Foster, serving in the Royal Anglia Regiment, who was tragically killed in Afghanistan. In the year where there were a number of commemorations of the First World War, it was particularly fitting. I'd like to thank Councillors Clark and Councillor Carter, who are here today, as well as council officers, the Royal British Legion and others taking the lead and organising many moving events. We also welcome the Royal Anglia Regiment exercising their freedom to march through the town, a spectacular and heartwarming event, yeah. with around, around 5,000 residents lining the streets, bringing the community together and showing our support for those who risk their lives for our country. We've had great progress in the Enterprise Zone, with <coughs> Rosie on the Narrow announcing their expansion and long-term commitment to Harlow, and a development partner appointed for a state-of-the-art science park um, on land owned by the council. And of course, the confirmation that Public Health England will be moving their headquarters and national science club to Harlow. I could go on, but I've chosen this selection to highlight some of the assets that make Harlow a great place. It's green spaces, it's artistic heritage, it's community spirit, and some of the fantastic economic potential that is coming to fruition. A key focus for me and the council is securing the investment in housing, in infrastructure, in skills, to enable Harlow and all its residents to realise that potential. There are, of course, challenges ahead. The impact of the vote to leave the European Union is not yet known, in terms of timescales, the sort kind of deal on trade uh, on devolution, and it remains to be seen if that will have a positive material impact on focusing resources, powers and responsibilities at local level, where the needs and aspirations of our communities are best understood. We need investment in infrastructure, a new hospital, regeneration of the town centre, and, and in road and rail. While achieving the ambition of Harlow being the northeast terminus of cross rail too, particularly in the first phases, is going to be problematic. I welcome the explicit mention of Harlow in the cross rail two growth commission report just published in the last few days, and the rec recognition that full tracking West Anglia line is an essential prerequisite for cross rail two, and the benefits that itself will bring to Harlow. We need a new junction on the M11, as recognised by a resolution of this council. But I appreciate that the sequencing and the route will English expect from your opinion. When we've had started the consultation that has recently been concluded, I'm sure we'll have a full debate on this and of spatial options in the round trial for housing growth. But whatever the outcome of that debate, I do know that it's essential that we reach agreement and await on a way forward, and soon, if Harlow is to truly reach its potential. A lot of these infrastructure investments will be dependent on achieving the scale of housing growth, both to directly meet the needs of a growing population and to provide the critical mass and investment money. We need to explore creative solutions locally for getting the right mix of housing, including truly affordable and social housing, to meet the obvious need, 
and to ensure everyone can benefit from what Harlow has to offer and what it will offer in the next few years. While great strides be made in educational provision in Harlow, with the UTC, Harlow College and the secondary schools leading the way, we need to do more to promote the great opportunities in science, technology, engineering, maths and computing, and to get the investment in skills needed for everyone to take advantage of the great economic opportunities. We also need to be bolder, bolder and more proactive in shouting about the many great things in Harlow, both internally and to the wider world. Using our great artistic legacy, our fantastic green spaces, our community spirit to attract businesses and visitors, recognise the contribution that these things can make to the growth and regeneration of Harlow, and to maximise the use and enjoyment by the people of Harlow. And finally, I recognise we need to do a lot more to tackle the issues of fairness, equality and equity. To recognise there is still, much, still too much disparity in things like life expectancy, 12 years less in my ward than just a few miles down the road in Church Langley. To address with partners public health indicators such as physical activity, adult and child obesity, and alcohol related illnesses. That's why, despite not being an overly great role model myself, I'm a passionate supporter of initiatives like the Parkrun and the recent Junior Parkrun. I want to conclude by saying I'm immensely proud of Harlow, of the place and of the people. But we need to work hard to ensure that Harlow remains an open and welcoming place, that we maximise its potential and we secure the much needed investment. <coughs> I know that Harlow has a great future, and with the right leadership and tenacity, we can and will make a positive and visible difference. Thank, Thank you, Madam Chairman. I am delighted to set out the Conservative state of the Council response this year. But before I set out our view on the last municipal year, it is important to recognise the result of the EU referendum. Harlow voted overwhelmingly to leave, and that result must be respected. Whatever side of the debate councillors were on, it is now our responsibility to make Brexit work locally. <coughs> our businesses who work within the European single market are looking for leadership locally. And we must work with them to offer confidence that they will continue to thrive and find new markets to grow their business. Harley should take advantage of Brexit. The town is strategically placed to offer businesses across the world a location to grow their UK arm. The Harlow Enterprise Zone will offer some of the best facilities in the eastern region. Fast internet speeds, robust infrastructure, offices close to an international airport with fast train connections to London. All of this opportunity for business needs an administration ready to embrace change after Brexit. The truth is, this administration is not ready or able to get on with that task in my view. In a time of change, Harlow has the potential to be one of the leading district authorities in the country for growing business, helping young people to achieve their life ambitions, services for all residents, delivering on the environment and ensuring good quality, affordable housing. But this administration is letting down residents in all of these areas. If this council wants to be a leading authority, it must first establish the right culture across this town. A community where aspiration and innovation is the driving force in everything we do. I was born and bred in Harlow. This town has given me the chance is to access many great opportunities, and I want future generations to be able to do the same. The young people in our town are a shining beacon of success. This council needs to think about the long term and embrace the views of all generations in our town to deliver the change for the better in this town. One of the biggest challenges for the long term implications for all of us in this community is the future of the services currently delivered by Keir Harlow. The council is working towards an optimistic target of launching a new landscaping and housing maintenance service under the HTS group. There are still questions over what will happen when the Keir contract ends <coughs> and when the HTS group commences operations on the 1st of February 2017. Now HTS has many risks the resolution of historic liabilities of Keir Harlow to Harlow Council, 
How will HTS ensure all legacy work, including boiler maintenance, grass cutting, general work carried out by Keir? How is that going to be picked up by the group? These questions need to be answered for residents. The financial management associated with the establishment of HTS Group needs more robust oversight too. It is concerning that the, this group, the <coughs> HTS Group, does not even have a financial director to ensure key regulations are being followed through. The total forecast spending or the demobilisation of the joint venture with Keir Harlow and the setup of HTS is over a million. This is a huge undertaking by this council, and I remain <coughs> sceptical that the right, this is the right answer for our community. I maintain the view that the council should have launched a procurement exercise to find an external provider rather than go it alone. We cannot afford a drop in standards next year. Residents rely on such key services in our town. This opposition is focused on how to deliver a strong local economy that creates jobs and a council that offers value for taxpayers' money. At a time of change in this country, there should be a renewed focus on our local economy. But this administration is lagging behind. It is disappointing that the council's planned economic development strategy has been kicked into the long grass. There is a present need for that council strategy to provide economic direction, but they have no ideas on what to do. This lack of progress on the big decisions is reflected in the efforts to adopt the local plan for Harlem. Now, the leader has announced that there will be a special council to discuss the local plan and other major infrastructure. The new local plan is crucial as it will shape development in Harlow to 2031. It will be a key vehicle for delivering, it will be a key vehicle for delivering housing Harlow needs. Now is the time that the administration steps up to the plate, thinks about the long term, tackles the perverse delays in adopting this new plan, as this is a prime example of the lack of leadership under this administration. There is a great need for a good mix of housing, including stock that is affordable in our town. But these developments must be sustainable and in keeping with the original master plan for Harlow. This administration needs to push this forward. The problem is, when this administration does try to do something, it turns out to be bad news. Take the council's new services strategy, customer services strategy, and the planned closure of the cash office, a well-used frontline service. I fear the planned closure of the cash office is the beginning of a wider strategy by Labour to dismantle key services. We have not had clear assurances that residents are going to be consulted about this planned closure. It seems that this administration sees residents' views as a minor detail of this matter. The council must organise a resident-led body that is consulted on all these changes now without delay. What concerns me most is Labour's inability to come up with a clear and compelling vision for our town. They have been wandering from issue to issue without a clear strategy to deliver a better deal for residents, focusing instead on increasing council tax and delaying the big decisions. This is not the right path for our community. You only have to look at the stalled progress on town centre regeneration. It is, this it is this administration that took advice from the opposition and finally pushed through plans for a clear strategy, well, a draft strategy, to push greater action on town centre regeneration. We need more than that. We need a master plan that pushes this forward for our community. We proposed a clear plan this year as an opposition. With the threes in council tax, by finding savings that do not impact on frontline services. A con conservative administration will aim to deliver a community in which everyone has the chance to succeed, no matter who they are or where they come from. We want a council which helps to deliver residents' aspirations. This is the way to deliver one Harlow, 
working for everyone in our community. So I believe this council must be bold, must be brave, take on the big decisions this community faces by planning for the long term. The truth is that this administration hasn't got what it takes to lead our town into a better future. We, the Conservatives, are ready to show the leadership Harlow deserves now. Madam <laughs> Chair, during last year I have heard many statements on what this current administration is going to do to help the residents and businesses of this town and to improve living standards of everyone. Where this has happened, we in UKIP have congratulated the administration. But now we must be honest. The second budget I have heard has once again increased council tax by one and a half percent. This when there are many in our town that struggle to make ends meet. There was also an alternative budget with no increase to council tax, which we supported. At last, an agreement has been reached on the Prentice Place refurbishment. But at what cost? I believe it is at some £150,000 per unit. Is this value for money? It has, all, it has also taken nearly 13 years and will still not commence for another 12 months at least. Next, we have our town centre. Money was set aside to start on improvements to the town centre. This sum was actually declared in 2014, my first year. Last year, I was invited onto a cross-party working group. We had a good walk round the town and was also involved in a seminar. I thank Councillor Durkin for this. But as our town centre dies, what council-led improvements have we seen? I must say, very few. Yes, very few. Also, around our hatches and shopping areas, what has happened? Again, very little. Yes, there has been movements on some things, but in general, actions are very slow, if anything happens at all. Now we have other main improvements coming. First one is the 7A junction on the M11. We've, everybody's talked about this today. Has town-wide consultation been undertaken by ECC? No. They have done as, as little consultation as necessary. This administration must hold ECC to account and ensure that all residents of our town are consulted. It will impact on us all. The second is the improvement at Briars, Aitchfield and Copshaw Close. This programme is moving forward, but I do not agree with the lack of actual housing coming back into our housing stock. Some £800,000 will be lost in rental income. Is this the correct way? The council had a level of 30 plus percent for social housing. This has dropped to below 20 on one Sorry, this has dropped to 20% on one new development and 0% on others. On the above, let me lay the lack of actions at this administration's door. But cast a major vote of thanks to all council officers and employees for their hard work over the past year. <coughs> I'd like to give my personal congratulations to our CEO, Mr Morley, on his award in the Queen's Honours yeah. which has already been stated. Finally, we must accept the views of our residents. By re-electing the current administration to lead this council for the next two years, this is democracy. I see many members opposite agreeing with this statement. Now, will this administration give way to democracy on the referendum? This is only a small item, but we want to prove that, to the town that we are listening to them. The referendum took place just over four weeks ago. At the count, we had a turnout of over 70%. 62% voted to leave, whilst the other 28 to remain. 
All the wards in Harlow, all the wards, voted to leave. Excuse me. I've got stuff here. That's typical. Do more of that, wasn't it? We had a debate last year on the flags which adorn our flag posts. I call on this administration to take action indicated by our, by our residents and replace the EU flag with the Union flag and have the flag of St George and the town banner either side. Will this administration let democracy speak on this issue? Or is it only when it suits the party opposite that democracy counts? Will the members opposite listen to our residents? Can you draw to a close, please, your time? Finishing now. Will the members opposite listen to our residents' opinions on the EU? Your actions will be your proof. Thank you. Uh, I'll speak briefly because I realise we only have a set amount of time um, for this debate tonight. I will speak very briefly regarding housing and particularly the effects on council tenants in this town. When I took over this portfolio a very short time ago and sat down and went into great detail with housing officers, <coughs> it became crystal clear to me that we have a current government that is totally anti-council tenants, that is totally anti-council housing. And the effects on this town in the next few years, which I can only describe, will be horrifying and devastating. I want to start on a more positive note before I go on to the challenges that we face here in Harlow on housing. Because there has been, no matter what the backdrop of financial restrictions that have been put up, up, upon us, we have actually been quite successful in several areas. In the last 12 months, we've actually reached over 40,000 improvements to council homes in this town. And I think that's a, a magnificent achievement. <coughs> We've also managed to increase all our housing needs requests because at the moment the needs for temporary housing in this town in the last 12 months has increased by 35%. That is a daunting fact that I think we all need to look at and the reasons behind that. And it's, a it's a great credit to our officers that we've had an increased demand of over 35% and all those requests have been met. We've met the telecare accreditation, accreditation sorry, achieved now for all our um, people using the telecare services, the fifth year running. We've assisted 35 families out of fuel poverty. That is a tremendous backdrop of what we've had to put up with. Turning to the challenges, which unfortunately list higher more than actually the things we've done right because of the, su the suffering of, from the government, or from party in front of me, is quite a lot we need to challenge. I, do, I have a completely different view to Councillor Charles and I'll, I'll move away from care to HTS. I see it as an opportunity in this town. I see it as an opportunity to deliver. I see it as an opportunity to take back control and run services for people in this town. And I, thought, I certainly for one am looking forward to its implementation in February. But by far the biggest challenge facing us in this council, particularly in the next 12 months, is the implementation of the Government's Housing and Planning Bill 2016. Amongst other names, called the Pay to Stay Act. Extending the right to buy for the sale of higher value council homes and people earning over 30,000 will be required to pay market rent and not social rent, but what, we, what we're not being told and what we all know is all the proceeds of that will go straight to central government and not back into this town. A massive reduction of income in housing in this town. Together with welfare reforms and rent reform, it's causing local authorities up and down the country major issues with their housing budgets. The new bill does not even make it clear at the moment who's going to be paying all the administration costs of this new act. What is clear though, it will pour money straight to Whitehall at the expense of council tenants. For us in Harlow, we need to have a look at the impact of this quite quickly. We need to look at the negative impact it's going to have on delivering decent homes, the negative impact it's going to have on building council housing, the negative impact it's going to have on trying to deliver our capital programme. 
Also, a major concern that I certainly have, and I'm sure the administration have as well, the removal of lifetime tenancies is a major concern. It is an unwanted issue for many council tenants. For example, elderly tenants who want, wish to downsize to smaller properties will be reluctant because they're not going to be wanting to go into a new tenancy that is less secure. The effect of this bill will be horrendous. We have over 5,000 families in this town on a waiting list, desperate for bigger housing. And here we are, having the government introducing this act that will have an absolutely detrimental effect on people in this town. <coughs> I also have great concerns regarding the government's supported housing review, which is due so shortly. Likely implications could mean that there will be extra service charges for people living in supported housing, or even stopping support altogether. So I really have major concerns about Looking forward, on a more positive note, I can assure the people of this town, I can assure the people in the audience and the media today, this administration still remains a major That's aspiration. You had your time, just can't okay, I'll sum up now, thank you, Chair. Still has a major aspiration of building council housing, building on our success in the past with this Labour Authority built the first council homes in this town for many decades. But we will have to look to try and achieve this in many different ways. We will still strive deliver these <laughs> homes for all the tenants in this town and we will continue to, to run a service. Thank you. Councillor Dirk. Uh, sorry, sorry. No worries. Thank you very much, Madam Chairman. Um, I don't think it's appropriate that anybody in this chamber takes lectures from Joel Charles because, <laughs> yeah. let's be honest, he was the architect of big society and actually that turned out to be a big failure and it actually was about big closures. He talks about big decisions but what we got was big red pots. So I really don't think that the Tories have got any room to discuss over these particular issues. And I dare both the leaders of the opposition to stop talking down this town and actually look at the truth. Go out with your eyes open and look at the town centre today. Look what's happening to the Marks and Spencers building. Look what happened to the Harvey Centre. Look what's happening to the new restaurants. Look what's happening to the, uh, to the, the new cinema of the building. Look what we've only heard this week about the potential development of Terminus House. We know that footfall is increasing, activity is increasing, Harlow is working. And for them to have the tenacity to say that this town is failing is probably more about their views than actually the reality of this town and they should be ashamed of themselves. If they're complaining about the hatches, go and have a look at them. See how tidy they are. See how full they are. See how busy they are with diverse communities, diverse shops that are making a difference for local people. He criticises, and new kid criticised, Prentice Place. How dare they? Prentice Place was four-staged. We built a new play area, we built a new wet area, we built new housing and flats. What we are now doing is completing that task by building the new shops that the businesses want and need and require, and so does that community. So for them to insult the community of that is, un is not acceptable. If they want to look, then go look at Latin Bush. Latin Bush is full. Look at the Enterprise Hub. It is full. I ask them to go look at the new council houses that we built. I dare them to have a look at that and not be impressed. I dare them to go look at the town park and see the amazing thing that we have done under this administration. I dare them and then come back and say that Harlow is failing. Harlow is open, it's honest and it's open for business. We did talk about the referendum and I spent this morning at Princess Alexandra Hospital talking to the Trust Board because we've got 150 international staff due to join the teams in the next 18 months. We're working hard to give them assurances that this is a good place, a good country and a good town to work. And that is the ramification of that decision. But we are working through that and we are making that particular difference. It is absolutely pathetic that the only thing that UKIP can come up with is a flag. Can we remind them that we are still in the EU? We have many EU residents. We have many EU businesses. We are open for business and we should celebrate the diversity of our town and we should keep going on at that one. 
And the final area is if you can't see anything, then go to the enterprise zone. Look at our bright future. What will that provide for young people and for this whole wide community? So for them to say, with their narrow eyes, that Harlow is not working, is clearly that they need to get off the Pokemon and put their eyes up and actually look at the real difference. They're half empty, we're half full, we're listening to people that are empty vessels. They have got nothing to add, nothing to say. We should be proud of Harlow, we are proud of Harlow, we are making that difference and we will continue to do that. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor. Thank you, Chair. Um, this is uh, a very welcome debate. Um, I was beginning to feel up till a few minutes ago that everybody was uh, chummy and uh, quite happy, <laughs> quite, well, happy, quite, happy <laughs> quite happy with what's going on. Um, the truth is that uh, both sides uh, of this council are very um, enthusiastic about Harlow, that uh, they <coughs> welcome uh, where Harlow is, is going, and they welcome that the money that is coming into Harlow and the business and the employment and the housing and all those things which have to be managed. The truth is that we are only discussing here not how does Harlow survive, but how does Harlow go forward? And how is the money being spent? And uh, on what do we spend the money? But only eight years ago, um, I remember feeling that this country uh, felt it had no future. It was uh, laboring, if I can use that word, under the results of the worst economic recession, in, certainly in my memory, and uh, probably in, in people who've even, uh, who are even older than me. And I think it's just worth pausing for a moment and realising that the argument that we're having about how we spend the money, we wouldn't be having if the money wasn't there to spend. Uh, and I think we ought to uh, give thanks for the fact that since the current government has been in power, that the economy has taken a turn for the better. And it is now one of the leading economies in Europe, one of the leading economies in the world. Uh, and we wouldn't be having arguments about how we spend the money if there was no money to spend. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. And I think I'd like to start by saying that I think I'm really proud that the administration has managed to make the Civic Centre a Pokemon gym um, and the two Pokestops outside. I think that's been a great time tonight with lots of people outside. <laughs> um, I'd like to start just talk a bit about the positives of the previous, previous year um, with this administration that I've had, we've had in my, my portfolio in the youth community. I'm very proud that we have successfully secured several high profile literary prosecutions making clear the message that you don't mess with Harlow. It's Harlow you must keep tidy and we all have a responsibility to play. Um, and that has been very important and very happy that we've managed to do that. I'm very proud that we managed to find and secure the funding to run another successful crucial crew going out to uh, primary school children across Harlow um, to see how they can contribute in our society. I'm proud that we, um, and very many thanks to the overview committee who um, completed and agreed the review of the Playhouse, um, looking to look forward, and there's a big work to be done this year in securing a long-term future of the theatre to make sure it does remain open and, uh, and uh, accessible to the public. And I thank councillors on both sides of the chamber for all their hard work on that and their support going forward to continue that going forward. Um, we've made huge steps forward in becoming a Harlow and Harlow becoming a dementia friendly town. We launched Harlow Dementia's Alliance's DFC symbol and Keep Safe scheme. Something simple that shops can put up to make sure that people can see and know they can go in, but it's a safe space for people with dementia. With something with a disease that is growing and very, very close to my heart, I'm very proud that Harlow Council has been able to show some leadership and very much thank, thank the Harlow Dementia Alliance for all they've done in the town for it including the training that's been dementia friends has been provided across the council staff and many councillors here have undertook it as well. I'm very proud that we've completed the project in redevelopment of the town park and Pets Corner. 
very proud that we got the Green Flag Award. It's fantastic to see our green open spaces thriving um, and being used as they should be. Yeah. We were successfully awarded the 18-month travel injunction, the first of its kind for its town. We've continued to lobby for a transit site in Essex, so we don't just put a plaster on the problem, but we look at the long-term solutions to keep a coherent and accepting society. We successfully had a big arts conference, Harlem Creates, and with many things thriving in our arts. We've got culture and our arts <coughs> growing. And it's one of the things actually making jokes about Pokemon Go. Their poker stops are art and sculptures. One of the reasons why we have so many in the town is many young people are currently enjoying from the game because they are in there and featured. And more and more people might need to know about our fantastic sculpture collection we have across the town, which I guess is for many people when you grow up with it in your neighbourhood, you just don't even realise. Um, so it's really important that we all work together because it is a main source of tourism. And after the exhibition last year, we have had members come through. We had someone come down from Leicester who was flying up from Sunset and actually came two days early with, with their wife to stay in Harlow to look at some of the sculptures and to visit the gallery. And I think that's a fantastic success story about putting us on the arts map and culture map. We've also started a pilot project with the LGA of community engagement and how we can improve that and that's fantastic. I'm also proud to talk about that we have undertook <coughs> and completed the customer services review to take forward this, this, this customer service and to council, to streamline it, to make it more efficient and to make us a better council. But the opposition, as very often, are full of rhetor rhetoric and no substance. Our customer service plan clearly outlines there will be consultation with residents, there will be consultation with groups, and it is a lie to say otherwise. It is a lie to say to older people and disabled people that they will not be able to pay in person anywhere. And I would ask the opposition to apologise for a publicly meetings this week, scaremongering and fear about older people not being powered. Clearly part of the plan, and we clearly said this last week, and it's clearly over the overview, the cash office here will be closing, but the access to payment in person will not stop. We will look to develop with the post offices and local banks, like many, many uh, utility bills and things are, to actually the same way as many older people paying their bills, it just will not be here. Allow us to free up that space and that resource to really focus on the council resources on solving all the issues that we have here. But Councillor Charles and the opposition can keep spreading their fear. It didn't work well for them last year. It didn't work well for them in these elections. We've, I'm really pleased to welcome three fantastic new councillors. I look forward to working together with the administration for another year in the town. Thank you, Councillor. Thank you, Councillor. Can we move to the summing up? Councillor Pryor, would you like to start? I'll keep this short, Madam Chairman. When I made my speech, I said that where, where things have been success, we over on this side, UKIP, we had said congratulations to the administration. I actually asked how many council led improvements had there been in the town centre? We walked around the town centre with the money we had to spend talking about cleaning it up, painting some of the areas, making the lamppost, putting flowers in, etc., making it more environmentally friendly to people when they come, making it feel more friendly. I'd asked, and I, I don't expect an answer now, but I'd asked uh, Councillor Durkin to actually ask me, tell me, what has happened to any of those suggestions that were made? Don't expect an answer publicly, but you can listen. We listen <coughs> to rhetoric that's been said. Everybody in this council have got hollow hearts. When we, very funny, but when we work together as a council and we can get consensus across the groups, we, we make major things happen and they happen well and it improves everybody in hollow. When we argue and we get not different opinions, but just, just basically bad arguments and we're not all together, then I'm not saying they fail, but they don't work quite so well. I said this last year, I said it the year before, I only wish this council would work more cross-party and not try and point score 
on politics. We are at local ground level on politics. We should be putting all our energy to ensuring that we make the best for our residents in Harlow. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Charles. Thank you, Madam Chairman. I think this has been an important debate tonight. I want to just cover some of the highlights. I do agree with Councillor Pryor. He will remember that we both introduced the EU flag motion in this council. And of course I recognise that there are serious implications for us leaving the European Union. But it would be a statement of principle, given the town has told us that they want to leave, that we lower the EU flag. And I think yeah, yeah. Bill is right in what he says. Yeah. On housing, the Conservatives are not anti-council tenants. We never have been. We've always advocated in Harlow for a good mix of housing, including affordable housing. That is the bedrock of being a new town Conservative, and I would absolutely oppose what has been said on that. Of course, the new government has advocated that this will be a country that works for everyone, and that social justice agenda will touch the lives of thousands of people in this community for the better. We have a growing economy, we have high unemployment, so I don't recognise the climate of fear that is painted by the administration on the economy. No way. In terms of HTS, there are huge questions about the February implementation. We have huge concerns about grass maintenance, where the legacy work that's been carried out by Key will be continued. These details need to be ironed out. There's an awful lot of work going on in this council to deliver it, and it's right residents know the major implications for it. Unfortunately, as much as I have a lot of respect for Councillor Durkin, he does have a short memory on the Big Society Fund, because it was his administration that carried on the Big Society Fund, they just called it a different name. <laughs> um, in terms of Harlow Town Regeneration, it was this opposition that pushed the council to do something. Saving Harlow Town Centre, the campaign led <coughs> by my leader, Andrew Johnson, got the administration to actually get on with the job. In terms of the customer services strategy, Councillor Tool was so proud of this report that she didn't even turn up to Cabinet to advocate it. Frankly, what I'm appalled about is a frontline service is going to be closed by this administration. We shouldn't be attacking frontline services, we should be maintaining them. And the thousands of transactions that are carried out in that cash office and the strength of feeling at the tenants forum about this matter shows residents care about frontline services. The administration might not, and the council talk and shake your head, but the facts speak for themselves. Mm. Ultimately, this opposition is ready to take on the challenge of promoting an aspiration society, delivering on innovation, promoting crazy. business yeah. growth. They're not up to the job, the Conservatives are. Councillor Charles keeps talking about these perverse de delays in an urban plan. I mean, he said this in a public meeting, um, that Harlow Council was the only council um, that hadn't got um, a, a local plan in place. Of course, it's just clearly not true. There is a, a clear timetable, um, and the important thing about this clear timetable is it's coordinated with every other local district. That the, the, clear plan is for Uttlesford, Epping Forest, East Hart and Harlow to simultaneously submit their local plans for examination of public early next year, um, because recognising that you, know, you can't do all of these things in isolation. Um, Councillor Pryor talked about um, the potential of social housing. I would love to build um, more social housing. Um, unfortunately, the government has changed all the planning rules yeah. to, uh, to allow, in retrospect, uh, in planning permission that's been granted on the basis of um, 30 or 35 per cent of social housing, to, to change all that, as long as the developers claim it's not viable um, to build them. So, uh, we are going to be exploring um, you know, some creative options. I'm going to have to be creative options for building more social and council housing. I'm going to absolutely do that. Um, Councillor Charles talks about um, delaying the big decisions. On, on almost every issue where this administration has taken strong, decisive leadership on shovel injunction, on street lights, on bringing in-house um, uh, maintenance services, on the customer services strategy. Um, they try to um, delay stuff. Um, apparently, conservative means let's not change anything. Let's freeze everything in, in stone. Um, 
the customer services strategies, um, the cash they talk about closing frontline services, because that's a nice buzzword that he thinks might resonate um, in, in the press. What this is about is recognising the modern world. This is about recognising that um, a large proportion of people want to do business with the council, pay their council tax bills, pay their, pay their rent, um, request services, at a time and place of their choosing. And that's what we're going to enable with digital services. That will allow um, more resources to be focused on those people that either can't or, or, or don't want to interact in that way, to provide a personal service and for those people who have, have different circumstances. Um, we are showing absolutely clear leadership. It's on the, on the enterprise zone driving that forward. Um, I, I do speak to the um, Harlow Chamber of Commerce formally at least two or three times a year, and informally on a lot more frequent basis than that. And I address them formally um, to talk about uh, how Harlow is open for business, the fantastic opportunities. And that's where I just want to end. The first of my opening statement and the first of my closing statement is that Harlow has a fantastic amount to offer. It has a great amount of potential. And we have great plans for maximising that potential going forward. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Do you wish to speak? Yes. You wish to speak now. Anybody else want to speak? <coughs> In that case, we vote. Does everyone accept them? Agreed. Uh, reports from officers that are none. Minutes of Cabinet and Committee meetings. We should note the following uh, Committee meeting notes which are listed in your agenda. And also one scrutiny committee on the 15th of March. Um, noted? Noted. Right. I would just like to remind people of a few dates they might like to put in their diary. First, there will be a special council on the 31st of August. I hope everybody has got that one. Uh, then I'd like to remind people that BJ Day, it will be commemorated on the 15th of August. I think that's 11 o'clock, but the time will be confirmed in due course. We will be laying a wreath um, at Netswell Cross by the Greyhound. You might not go that way. Then I would like to remind you the Civic Service will be on the 11th of September. We are making it as multi faith as possible, as cross party. The three theme will be harmony, so I would hope to see a good number of councillors there. Lastly, the civic dinner is on the 21st of October. Now, we had to cancel last year because there wasn't enough support, and that seemed partly because it was announced rather late, so I'm giving <coughs> good and due warning, please put the date in your diary. And with that, we close the meeting at 8. Good